One thing that we focus on a lot is user research and moderated user testing. That's a really good way to get buy-in from stakeholders. If they can see a customer on their website talking about an issue they're having and saying, I wish the site did this or I really don't like this. For some people, that really helps them understand it a lot more than showing them a, you know, a set of data that explains the exact same issue. I think particularly with kind of designers and copywriters, they obviously want to make the site look as beautiful as they can. So we do have to you know, try and rein them in a little bit sometimes. But as long as they're completely on board with what we're trying to do i think that's the easiest thing so we're not just kind of sending out designs to clients and saying can you approve this we're really trying to explain the reasoning behind why we're doing everything we do the more testing you want to do the more complex the roadmap mm -hmm. gets about where you can test here and you want to do two tests on this page but you can't do them at the same time necessarily and all those kind of things come into play it's sometimes difficult to do is to just not make changes to an experiment while it's running which can also be tempting if you particularly if you see it performing negatively and you think of a new idea oh let's just change this or move this element up here that obviously mm -hmm. then completely invalidates what you're doing one of the things we do as part of the onboarding process is just understand what kind of metrics clients are looking at. That's normally the best way for us to get buy-in from those stakeholders, particularly if they're not in the program day to day. Welcome to another episode of the CROR series by BWO Podcast. Get ready for some fun, insightful conversations about experimentation, user research, and the huge impact that CRO can have in your business. Before we speak to our guest, here's a very quick overview of who we are and what we do. VWO is a leading experience optimization platform that you can use to manage your experimentation program and deliver personalized experiences. One of our most popular offerings is VWO Insights, a platform to analyze user journeys and identify conversion roadblocks. Take a free trial with VWO today and optimize experiences across all your digital platforms. Now, let's jump right into this conversation. Welcome to a new episode of the CRO Hour by VWO Podcast. We are thrilled to have you with us today as we welcome our special guest, Matt Maidman. Uh, Matt is the head of CX at Rio Digital. It's a digital experience agency in London. Uh, and he's an experienced CRO expert with a passion for delivering top-notch customer experiences. Uh, Matt brings over four years of hands-on client-side experience in industries like travel, fashion, um, and e-commerce. In these roles, he has led uh, a comprehensive optimization workflows from test ideation and research to post-test analysis, all with the goal of delivering engaging customer experiences that uh, meet measurable business KPIs. I'm sure, like me, you're excited as well as we dive deep into the insights from his experience uh, portfolio. Welcome, Matt. Welcome Thanks. to the Zero Hour. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh, how did your week go? Very good. Yeah, not too bad. Very good. How are you? Good. Good. And how was summer overall? Good. Yeah, managed to get out of the UK for a few weeks, which was good. Oh, where was that? Outside the UK? Oh, spent a uh, week, 10 days in Greece, which was nice. Nice. Uh, so that was really good, yeah. Feels like a Wonderful. long time right now, but yeah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, summer is summer is behind us. I did not get a chance to uh, travel this summer, but really looking forward to the you know, holiday season uh, coming up. Uh, just before we get started, I'm just curious to know. Uh, you know, I'm new to podcasting. This is my second podcast. Have you uh, you know done any podcast before? Is the first podcast? Yeah, a couple. Not not for a little while, but a couple particularly. Um, sort of during lockdown time, yeah. Got it. So it's been a while since the lockdown uh, yeah. period. So this is sort of a podcast start for a while, Brilliant. right? Got it. Got it. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Matt, again. And uh, let's dive in. Uh, my first question to you is, uh, like, how does your team prioritize, you know, which hypothesis to test out first when you're running a CRO program for your clients? Like, how do you prioritize hypothesis? Yeah, so we have a pretty um, deep prioritization framework, pretty detailed that we take clients through as part of the onboarding process, but then sort of um, as we go through our quarterly sort of planning um, cycle with clients, we take them through that again. So that basically feeds in all kinds of hypothesis and test ideas, both from our side, but also from the client as well. So they could feed in some of their own ideas. Um, and essentially that framework is us figuring out um, primarily how much evidence both quant and qual do we have to support those hypotheses that is the the main goal of it so obviously the the less evidence we have the less scoring that's that idea is going to get um, but also encompasses 
things like the traffic on the page type we're talking about, um, the contribution to overall conversion rate of the website that that page has. So are we talking about a test on a you know, blog page deep into the funnel that gets a few hundred visits a month that no one really looks at? No one buys from those pages, um, which is obviously still an opportunity, but it's not going to be as high as a, a product page or a basket that's getting a huge amount of traffic. Um, those are the kind of the two things that go into that that scoring process and um, feed that back to the client and then there's always a bit of back and forth around mm. how the ideas they want to prioritize that might meet some other specific business goals um but yeah the two key things are do we have evidence to support it and is the site in a place where we can test on those page types got it got it yeah uh, and you know i'm sure when you're talking to clients right you're presenting a bunch of testing ideas uh, i'm really curious to understand how do you you know, uh, secure the client buy-in, uh, ensure that they appreciate the value of your proposed approach. Like, what is your approach to make sure your clients sort of, uh, you know, accept this in terms of the ideas you've presented? Yeah, I think this kind of goes back to the first point around metrics sure. and, and the goals that we're talking about. So one of the things we do as part of the onboarding process is just understand what kind of metrics clients are looking at. Obviously, the big one's going to be conversion rate and sales and, and revenue, but there's also a bunch of soft metrics as well that clients are often interested in, so, you know, views to specific pages, interaction with certain functionality on the site, so, you know, chat, search, those kind of things. Um, so I think as long as we've got a clear understanding of what those goals are, we're presenting ideas that meet those goals and want to improve metrics around those goals. That's normally the best way for us to, to get buy-in from those stakeholders, particularly if they're not in the program day to day if they sit outside of the program in a different team or they're just too senior to be involved in it day to day um getting their buy-in to test them meet their goals is the is the critical thing got it yeah and i'm sure like when you're talking about uh, some of the metrics you're looking at both qualitative and quantitative uh, you know metrics um if you could just expand on that what are those metrics that you're looking at and how do they come into play? What kind of data sources you're looking at? And how do you prioritize them or balance them out rather? Yeah, so the the two obvious ones and, and mm. one thing that we focus on a lot is user research and moderated user testing on sites. Yeah, And I find that's a really good way to get um, buy-in from stakeholders that maybe are not that data focused and they're not in data day to day. If they can see a customer on their on their website talking about an issue they're having and saying, "I wish the site did this," or "I really don't like this," for some people that is that really helps them understand it a lot more than showing them a you know a set of data that explains the exact same issue. Right. Um, so using that usability testing to really show stakeholders, customers telling them they don't like their website is often really useful um, or even if they do just giving them positive feedback as well mm. um, and on the on the quant side we use a mixture of you know obvious um, analytic sources from the website whether that's ga or adobe or others um, to show them where customers are dropping off the site and where there's potential issues but also on the customer side we use quite a lot of voice of customer data as well provided by clients whether they're doing surveys on site they're doing post-purchase live chat uh, exports of that data so that can also feed into you know x number of people are talking about this as an issue on your site as well so kind of attack it from all sides Mm -hmm. Um, and then some more sort of generic heuristic analysis that we're doing on the site of you know kind of best practice and benchmarking against our existing clients as well got it got it yeah no that's that's pretty interesting uh you know from my experience, you know, I've seen a lot of businesses, it's a huge challenge for them to scale up their optimization program, uh, particularly e-commerce businesses who are trying to do more, uh, you know, server side tests to make those dynamic changes in the back end. Um, as an expert, what would you suggest these businesses? A, how do you scale up optimization? And B, uh, at a very specific server side level, uh, what factors should they, should they consider uh, from a server side perspective? Yeah, so on the, on the scaling side of it, that's yeah. a conversation we have regularly. I think once once clients understand the value behind CRO, they just want to go faster and they want to mm. do more. Um, and that's where that initial kind of prioritization framework comes in because the more testing you want to do, the more complex the roadmap mm. gets about where you can test here and you want to do two tests on this page, but you can't do them at the same time necessarily and all those kind of things come into play. Um, and also 
puts a huge amount more reliance on um, being able to analyze the data of previous tests that you've got to inform what you're going to do next. So a lot of the clients we talk to, if they're slight, if they're not on the mature side in terms of their, their program, they've probably been doing some ad hoc testing here and there. There's no real kind of strategy or data leading those ideas. Um, to really scale, you need a huge amount of data, both from your existing test, but just from other areas of your site going into it to help do that and regular um, sort of user research sessions and, and talking to customers to find new issues. On the server side, I think we've got a few clients that we work with that do um, some server side testing. The biggest area we see um, of customers getting into that is more on the sort of pricing and offers um, side of things in e-commerce and, and in other industries as well. So understanding what levels of delivery costs they can charge um, and on the subscription side, exactly the same thing. And they can change that, you know, dynamically in the back end. And actually, you know, in some instances, if you're increasing the, the threshold for free delivery, say you can do that without impacting conversion rate, then great. There's no obvious way to do that outside of server side. So um, those kind of insights are really, really useful. Got it. Got yeah. it. See, yeah. And, you know, when you are dealing with clients and you are sort of building up a CRO program, uh, CRO is the, uh, involves a lot of stakeholders, right? You're talk, talking with designers, copywriters, developers. Uh, now, as the head of CX, how do you make sure that everyone is aligned and, you know, the guardrails are set up and everyone is working towards similar kind of a goal? Yeah, I think on the client side, it's very similar to the to mm. the stakeholder point, just around making sure everyone's clear on the goals of the, the program itself and what we're trying to work towards. Um, but on a test-by-test -test basis, I think it's making sure there's a, a really clear test plan and documentation in place of, of what that specific test is trying to do. Um, I think particularly with kind of designers and copywriters, they obviously want to make the site look as beautiful as they can. So we do have to, you know, trying to rein them in a little bit sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But as long as they're completely on board with what we're trying to do, I think that's, that's the easiest thing. Um, so we're not just kind of sending out designs to clients and saying, can you approve this? We're really trying to explain the reasoning behind why we're doing everything we do. Sure, sure. Um, one of the one of the challenges with modern CRO is uh, businesses not really trusting test results. Um, I'm really curious to understand what safeguards do you follow uh, personally to ensure the test results are accurate and statistically they're significant and they make sense to the client. Yeah, there's a few things. So no matter what tool we're talking about, we work across a variety of tools. Mm -hmm. I think obviously the main one is going to be statistical significance. So we're not um, calling or concluding any test until that, that result is significant according to the tool. Um, but sometimes even if it is showing significant, we're using um, a minimum sort of time frame for any A-B test of at least two weeks. And um, mostly to take into consideration any kind of fluctuation around you know, site traffic, channel mix um, that happens just in terms of seasonality week to week of that business, um, particularly can be impacted by marketing channels. You know, whenever they're sending out specific email campaigns week to week, huge spike of traffic that may perform very differently to organic or direct traffic. So that two week time frame is really important. Um, and then the, the big one, which is sometimes difficult to do, is to just not get excited when you see a huge win in the first couple of days of a test and, and just want to call it straight away we're as guilty of that as as clients are as well um so really just trying to not look at it for a couple of days and, and let the data do its work really um and the, the big one we have to really not do is make changes to an experiment while it's running which can also be tempting if you particularly if you see it performing negatively and you think of a new idea oh let's just change this or move this element up here that obviously mm -hmm. then completely invalidates what you're doing. So um, even if you're still getting ideas for iterations and new versions of the test while it's live, just letting it run its course and not making any changes to it is is really important. Yeah. Yeah. That's very relevant, right? And that sort of leads into my next question. So at Rio, what does post-test analysis look like uh, for you when you're working with a client? Now, we, we know about the winning test. If you could just shed some more light around losing tests or tests that are not producing the expected results, how do you approach that? Yeah, like you said, the next the next mm. steps or recommendations for a winning test are really easy. Just implement it, hard code it as quickly as you can. Um, for losing tests, there's kind of two outcomes, I guess. There's a, um, 
obviously we're writing a complete write-up of every test. So the recommendation for a losing test could be um, let's park this and come back to it once we've got um, a fresh round of, of user insights or data to show what we should do next. Um, if we don't have a clear a clear reasoning as to why the test performed as it did. Um, but more often than not, we're using those those insights from use, from losing tests to instantly inform a new a new idea that we're going to go after, or it'll confirm something that um, either us or the client thought was a no brainer that actually has turned out to to be a loser, and maybe they were going to implement it anyway. And we've proven that it has a detrimental impact on performance. Um, so we're kind of using those losers to help validate some of the ideas that, that um, development teams within clients are having. Um, and help them prioritize a backlog of, of ideas they've got themselves that they were going to probably implement anyway. But we've proven that it may not be the right thing to do. Um, but yeah, very rare that we would just ditch a losing test altogether and there's no next step from it. Sure, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm sure clients are approaching you uh, with multiple use cases. One of the things that we often hear is friction points uh, on websites. Now, if you come across a certain friction point on a website, how do you determine whether you know, experimentation is the right approach or personalization is the right approach, or maybe a combination of both? Uh, because if you really think about it, experiments can involve both segmentation and targeted experiences, right? Uh, I'm just curious to understand what criteria you use to decide whether it's either one of both, one of them or sort of a hype model. Yeah, I think more often than not, it's a hybrid of the two. I yeah. think it would be very rare for us to start immediately with personalization, particularly with a new client. So mm -hmm. um, like you say, if there's, a, if there's an issue with a drop off at a specific point in the funnel, say the basket, um, we may not have data from all kinds of segments to know whether, what the, whether there's a different issue for different segments to begin with. So where we would normally start um, with an issue like that is a series of smaller experiments delivered to all customers of all different segments to yeah. understand how most people behave. And yeah. then within the results of that, break that data down into those segments, say new returning or customer has purchased before, hasn't purchased, what categories have they purchased, um, to understand whether there is an opportunity to personalize. Because um, I think going down that personalization route immediately, yeah. um, you're obviously going to, I mean, depending on the size of the segment, you're going to have much less traffic to test upon. Um, and the opportunity, if you can improve the performance of that segment, is probably going to be lower. Whereas if you can improve the performance for everyone, then all of those segments mm -hmm. are winning. Sure. So, yeah, I think experiment for all to begin with and then personalize those segments within it using that data. So the hybrid model is what you would do. Yeah, and not this. yeah exactly. Got it. Got it. Great. Now. Let's take a step back, Matt. You know, you, you're working with businesses of different kinds or different sizes in the UK. Um, what, do you, what do you have to say about the experimentation mindset amongst UK businesses? Do you see any unique challenges um, in the market, specifically the UK, or do you see any opportunities that exist, any areas of improvement, any of that? Yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, we work with businesses of, of varying sizes and varying maturity mm -hmm. levels within experimentation. So that's the obvious, you right. know, um, sort of difference that we see mm -hmm. across the board. Um, and we're working with, with clients in all of all of those areas. I think the biggest opportunity probably is helping clients to utilize data that they've already got. They're just not using or they're not incorporating into their, their day to day, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether that's through, um, analytics tools, whether that's the voice of customer data that a lot of businesses are gathering and just not using. Um, so that's that's one of the big ways we and sort of the unique challenges that customers have is we've got all this data, we don't know how to use it, um, and we want to we want to start experimenting. Um, or they've they've got an existing CRO program that's maybe lower on the maturity scale um, and they're doing a lot of ad hoc testing but they're not using any of that data they've got to inform it. Cool. Um... And, you know, one of the things that uh, we often face, uh, you know, as a vendor is that when we're talking to businesses, uh, we often come across businesses who are doubting the long-term benefits of CRO or maybe experimentation because experimentation takes time, right? It's not a month-by-month -month thing. It does take time to show its results. Yep, yep. Uh, would you have any advice for businesses, uh, you know, who are sort of doubtful from a benefit standpoint of CRO? 
Yeah, I mean, pa- patience is the obvious thing. Like you said, it, it takes time to, to get a program up and running, I think. But there are, you know, very low cost, very low risk um, tests that you can do. And, and the same with, with tools and vendors that you can get started with very, very quickly and launch very simple tests to start showing the value. So like we said at the beginning, I think once those senior stakeholders are on board with, with the process and, and where you're trying to get to and what goals you're looking at, um, that's that's the most important thing. But yeah, just just getting started with with something, um, I think is the best advice. Even if you don't have a, no one's going to have a full strategy to to begin with. Right. So so your message is just start somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Use the data you've got. Start with some very simple testing. Even if you're not necessarily generating huge amounts of revenue potential from those tests, you're gaining insights that you wouldn't have had previously. Um, about your customers. Got it, got it. And one final question, Matt. Uh, what would you say is the current impact or probably the future impact of AI or artificial intelligence or machine learning is going to be there on overall CRO uh, landscape? Yeah, huge. I mean, we're as as most people are, we're working on 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 technology using AI already. That's that's helping us to identify some of those issues and and friction points on site that we'd have had to do manually before that. I think ultimately there's always going to be that human element of, of creating those test hypothesis and, and design. And that, that prioritization framework is, is always has some subjective human elements to it as well. Um, But yeah, the biggest area that I think we're using now and in the future is going to be highlighting those, those issues in the funnel with the data Um, and also just processing that, huge amount of data we're talking about around um, you know voice of customer you might have thousands and thousands of survey responses that um, would take a human a couple of days to go through but AI can do it in seconds so that's already very very helpful absolutely absolutely well thank you so much Matt uh, for all your responses right let's take a step back uh, so the next session is a, a icebreak is a rapid fire session that yep. we're going to have Right. So I'm going to ask you a set of eight questions and it'll be great if you could just answer them as quickly as possible. Uh, just give it a second for me to bring up my questions uh, as I'm bringing it up. One second. Do you have a favorite favorite destination uh, that you would like to go to? Favorite destination? Uh, Mauritius. Mauritius. Have you been there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. And do you have a place that you ideally want to go? Uh, that I've never been to, probably Tokyo. Nice, got it. Great. That was not the rapid fire, though. I'll start the rapid fire right now. So the first question is, if you're starting off with your career in CRO today, what is one thing that you would do differently? One thing I would do differently. Um, I would say, don't worry about failing tests immediately. Don't assume everything you do is going to win, and be prepared to be prepared to be wrong. I think is the big one. Got it. Uh, next question is a more personal question. Do you have a go-to destination in Europe? In Europe, I would say uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. Pretty underrated, but beautiful, beautiful city. Mm. Got it. Uh, the next question is, what is one thing you think AI is going to replace in the next three years? It's going to replace. Mm-hmm. Uh, any kind of uh, live chat interaction. Completely replaced. Absolutely. Uh, any two books that you would recommend to, to our listeners? Two books. Uh, wow, I never read books. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, this is a rapid fire. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, <laughs> if not a CRO specialist, what other profession uh, would you have chosen? Oh, I always wanted to be an airline pilot, so I'd definitely go for that. Completely different. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if there is one CRO metric that you wish people would stop obsessing over, what would that be? Uh, controversial, but probably conversion rate. I think, um, or the conversion rate, of what, I guess, is the question. 
Um, exactly. Yeah. Got it. Final question. Uh, is it a dream or a goal? It can be a personal or a professional uh, that you want to achieve over the next three years. Next three years. I would love to do a marathon. Personally, that would be one thing I would pick. Will three years is realistic? I don't know, but maybe 10. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt, for your time. And thank you, listeners, for being a part of this podcast. We will be back with more such sessions in uh, the next few weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you.